If you're moving away from CRUD and towards a task-based UI with CQRS, like I've described in some of my videos, a common question I've been getting is, well, how does that work with the REST API? So I'm describing what the differences are between a typical REST API that really revolves around entities and CRUD and how you can map commands and queries to resources. Hey everybody, it's Derek Comartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. All right, so the first thing to clear up before I even get into this is the term REST. Now I'm gonna be talking about an HTTP API because that's really what I think the developer community at large is referring to when they use the term REST. And that's totally cool. There's nothing wrong with an HTTP API. It's exactly what I'm gonna to show today. All right, so through this video, I'm gonna be talking about um, kind of a, a warehouse uh, domain for a product. And I've been using this slide. I kind of have this entity that is a product. It has a SKU, that's the identifier, the name description, the sale price, the purchase cost from a vendor, the quantity, like the quantity on hand in the warehouse, whether it's for sale and with free shipping. So I think some of the, the problems that are stemmed and why people are confused about how CQRS and an HTTPI, uh, HTTP API work together is that there's this notion that HTTP methods need to map to SQL, for example, if you're using a relational database. So there's this concept out there, I don't really know how it got this overblown, is that you're thinking of that a get is a select, that a post is an insert, that a put is an update, that a patch is like a partial update and a delete's a delete. So if we were thinking about how that actually maps out to a route, you'd be thinking, okay, I can call get on slash product slash whatever the SKU is that will give me back that entity or that object. If I call post to slash products, that's going to add a new product to my collection, uh, my entity collection. A put will be a full um, update. So I would pass the entire object back to slash products and whatever the SKU is. Same thing for patch for a partial update and a delete as a delete. So there's this notion that you have to have this all this very CRUD behavior and that resources must be entities. And I, I'm kind of lost on how this got that uh, as a common misconception in my view of how this actually needs to work, which it doesn't at all. So I'll explain how actually commands and queries, because because you're really not doing CRUD anymore, how that maps to resources. Rather than resources being entities, your resources are gonna be commands and queries. So my video talking about task-based UIs, I used this UI that was very CRUD in nature, and you could think of it, if we were talking about what we were doing before, where you click save, and that would be doing a put to the particular product slash whatever the SKU is. And then I kind of redesigned this UI to actually be more task-centric. And then in doing so, kind of the realization where the boundaries are, that it's not necessarily one product, that it's probably multiple products or the concept of a product that lives in different boundaries. So you could have a product that lives in catalog that contains like the name and the description. And then there's, for example, the sale price, some other properties that belong to sales, the purchase price from the vendor or manufacturer that actually belongs to purchasing and then the quantity on hand actually belongs to the warehouse. So how does that map to an HTTP API is exactly that. The commands and queries are gonna to map to resources. So under the catalog, I'm gonna be able to call a get to a particular catalog, say for example, catalog slash products in a particular SKU. If I wanted to update that product, I can do that cruddy nature of thinking of an entity service, if you will. And that makes sense, particularly particularly in a catalog. Maybe I don't have any specific tasks related to it. But then in sales, okay, I can get the particular product and that will give me things like the, the sale price, whether it's for sale or if it's unavailable, and whether it's free shipping and the, the particular pieces of data that are applicable to sales and the, the piece of data it owns. And then instead of just being having this, okay, I need to update the entire product or do particular patches, and then kind of infer what the actual change is. If you're gonna have some particular command or action or task like increase in the price, that is a particular resource. So you're, for example, doing a post to that particular, in, to the increased price. Now using, if you care about the semantics of the methods, which I think you should, then realize that there was kind of method to the madness of trying, trying to map um, particular methods to SQL.
but it doesn't necessarily fully make sense. For example, because a put needs to be item potent. And if you want to make these particular commands item potent, which you can, and I'll probably cover this in other videos, so make sure to subscribe. And But for simplicity's sake, I'm saying when you call a post to that particular resource and you're increasing the price, it's going to happen. So the same thing with decreasing the price, marking something available or unavailable, those actually could be potentially item potent uh, just naturally. So those could be puts. Same thing with purchasing, same thing for the warehouse, that the particular commands are particular resources. A resource can be whatever you want it to be. It does not need to revolve around an entity. So I'll definitely harp on this more in other videos. Um, and I know it's a kind of a touchy subject to people and a lot of people have various opinions. But the reason why I say that anything can be a resource is because it can be. A resource is anything that has an identifier. So if you look on the Mozilla Docs, you know what I mean? A, a HTTP request is called a resource whose nature isn't defined further. It can be a document, a photo, anything else. Again, it does not need to be an entity. All right, so I covered commands and how those are resources. But then the question often becomes, okay, well, how does a UI work out? Well, you kind of got two options. And I think a lot of this is can, can be a mix and match in which option you choose. So if you, it's really about where you want to do the composition to build out your UI. So one option is to do that comp uh, composition on the actual client. That means that your client is going to call multiple different resources for multiple different services or boundaries to get the relevant data it needs for the particular UI that it has. So that means that like the catalog has its own resource to provide this information. Sales has its information that you, to, for the, like for changing the price and showing the sale price. The warehouse has the quantity on hand. So what that means is, is your UI is making multiple HTTP calls to those various resources to build out its UI. So the catalog might provide this particular set of information. The sales might provide, its resource might provide this particular piece of information to build out this UI. The second possible scenario here is to do all that common, uh, composition on the server. So instead, your client is actually only making one HTTP call to the server, and it's going to do the composition by fetching all that data uh, concurrently from all the different boundaries and then turning all that data into one particular response for your client. So instead of having all this disparate data everywhere, it's going to do that, but then combine it into something that contains the SKU, the price, the name, the description, I left it out here, but the quantity on hand, and all the other things that can build out that one big UI. So it's really about where do you want to do that composition? Do you want to do it on the client or do you want to have one particular resource that your client goes to that it does the composition for you? So I'm going to show my demo app that is using ASP.NET Core. I'm going to show the project structure of these controllers and where the routes are, as well as just vanilla JavaScript and HTML. If you are a code opinion developer level member, you'll get access to all the source code. If you want to get access to source code and become a member, Go to my channel, click the join button for more info. All right, so here's the project structure I have in ASP.NET Core. I have a couple different projects here, just for illustration purposes. I have this ASP.NET Core project. It really doesn't have much in it other than it's doing the host for ASP.NET Core, and it's referencing all these other projects. So if you're familiar with my loosely coupled monolith series, I'm kind of playing with that a little bit here. It doesn't necessarily need to be um, split by project. I'm just doing it just for illustration purposes that these are separate boundaries. So under the catalog, I have a uh, entity framework, DB context, and I have a product controller that does probably kind of what you would typically think is I have a get method that returns the product and I have a update method for this particular route that is a put that updates the particular product. If I keep going on here, uh, for purchasing, I kind of have that exact same uh, structure for sales in the warehouse. So in sales, I have a command for increasing the price, um, which is just that particular uh, route for posting, like I mentioned earlier, and we're just increasing the price. And then in the warehouse, I flipped that up a little bit because I knew people were going to lose their mind or comment <laughs> about having code in your controller and everybody's high on mediator. I posted videos about Mediator too. So just to switch things up, 
I have an inventory adjustment where I'm using Mediator instead to actually create a particular request that represents my command. And then I have a handler uh, that does that logic. And then I'm also publishing an event here that I'll kind of illustrate. All right, so I'm in my little demo task-based UI that I created. This is just plain HTML and vanilla JavaScript for the most part, just using fetch to make the HTTP calls. So this was kind of the CRUD portion. When I load the screen, we'll refresh it. We'll see the various, because I'm doing all the composition on the particular um, this particular page. So I'm making various calls here. I'm making a call to the warehouse to get the quantity on hand. I'm making a call to the catalog to get the, the name and the description. So if I go to preview, we can see that data. And then I'm making a call to the sales side to get the, uh, the product as well for the price and everything else. So I get, we can see the SKU, the price was the 85. All right, so let's do something simple. Like we're gonna do this save. We change something with our title, for example. We're gonna call save. So this is hitting my, just that, that kind of cruddy nature of in the uh, product controller for catalog. We're just calling our update just to update the entire product. If I jump back over to DevTools here, we can see that was our call. We were calling a put to catalog products, ABC123, and I'm just returning a 204. All right, so the other command I had was for in the sales side was increasing the price. So this one's pretty straightforward as well. We're at $85, I'm gonna be at $100, let's say. So we're gonna call increase price. And what I'm doing here is I'm just updating the price in line, returning a no content. And if we look on the server side though, so that was the call that we made, return the 204. We sent the relevant data. If I can, we can see the price there. Uh, and then what I did afterwards is once this returned and it was successful, I then called back our uh, API for the sales to actually get that product back. So this would be very typical of what you would see in a typical uh, post redirect that you would do in something like MVC. If you had a particular form where you were calling uh, a particular post to update the price or do whatever your command is. And then it would ultimately use a location header to redirect you back to a particular page, which you would then be refetching all the data to populate the page. I'm not using the location header. I will in a future video when I'm talking about hypermedia, but it's kind of that, um, that redirect kind of pattern that you're using. All right, so this last example I have of doing a inventory adjustment is really to me the heart of the whole thing and why you wanna be doing this in the first place. The reason why you wanna get away from CRUD and get into tasks and commands is because you're making things explicit of what users are doing. If you know what they're doing, then you can do other things based off workflow based on that. So here's my example of this. So we have our 15 quantity. I'm gonna do an inventory adjustment and I'm gonna say that um, it's not 15, we actually can't find all of those and we can really only find four of them. So I'm gonna do my inventory adjustment, basically removing 11. So here now I'm calling that particular route uh, for doing my inventory adjustment. And this was using Mediator. So I just basically, my actual route itself is ultimately very slim, just calling Mediator. And then in my particular handler, I have some logic here where, so I'm updating the actual um, quantity on hand, I'm saving it. And then what I'm doing is I'm publishing an event. Now, again, this is all in line because it's using Mediator, but if you're thinking about using events and messaging, this is what it's really applicable to, is because now you said, okay, we did an inventory adjustment. So inventory was adjusted. That's the event that I'm publishing. I'm gonna be publishing that event with information about the SKU and the quantity on hand. What's really important about that is that now we can have other parts of the system, other boundaries, react to that event and then possibly do other things, in which case I'm gonna do. So I'm publishing that inventory adjusted event. And now what I'm in, I'm actually in my warehouse side. And maybe we have some workflow that says, okay, if the particular quantity on hand for a product gets below a particular threshold, in this case, I've deemed it, I think five, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a purchase order requisition. So that purchasing can know, okay, we're really low on this particular quantity. Let's reach out and place a purchase order to our vendor or manufacturer to basically get more quantity on hand to increase our stock count. So in this particular case, yes, we are 
we've reached our threshold. So now we need to send another command into our warehouse to say, okay, let's create a purchase order requisition. That's really the big benefit of getting into commands and tasks is because you're being explicit. If you know exactly what the user is doing and what their intent was, then you can create relevant commands based off what just happened. And then events you can ultimately use in other parts of your system to decouple them to know that this happened in this part of the system. Maybe I need to be reactive and react in a particular way that I need to do something else in another part of the system. So if you're using SeekerS and you're using task-based UIs, creating an HTTP API is really just as simple as creating resources for your commands, determining whether you want to make them idempotent or not, or whether they're naturally idempotent, and then use the appropriate HTTP methods based on that. Where you want to do your composition for your query side, that's really up to you, whether you want to do them on the client, whether you want to do the composition on the server, you'll have to figure that out. Now, I will go into deeper dives in this, but for sure the thing I want to cover the most now in my next upcoming video related to this is using hypermedia and really the value behind it for your clients to show your clients these are the actions, this is the things that you can do based off state. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And of course, if you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.